gentleman, the defendant says it was not to blame. It says that it was shifting this car attached to an engine. It describes the mode of movement and through its witnesses declares that no obstruction existed between the man driving upon the truck and the car, that the bell was ringing, that there was an automatic attachment that kept it ringing from the time it was detached from the main train, as I understand the testimony, continuously ringing all the way down to the time of the accident. Now you have the testimony of a large number of witnesses called in behalf of the defendant. Of course, if the defendant was not negligent, it cannot be held for this accident, unless the defendant is liable under the law, that is, unless it is proved that the accident happened through the negligence of the defendant and without negligence on the part of the parties claiming damages, then to take the money of this railroad company and hand it to the plaintiffs would be no better than to break into a merchant's safe and hand his money to the passerby. We are engaged in a very responsible duty to decide whether we will take one man's money and hand it to another. I say that because this defendant railroad company is entitled to the same fair treatment that any individual is. I know I do not need to tell you that. There are the witnesses for the plaintiff tending to show this man did exercise care. He had occasion to delve upon the railroad's property. I think counsel for plaintiff did properly characterize him as an invitee, one who was invited there according to the plaintiff's own story. Remember, he was peddling, as it has been called, going about in a truck selling things to the country, to farmers and to the miners. And among other things he sold were fresh meats. And we can understand that fresh meat had to come in at intervals. He could not keep it in stock. He was going to the depot of the defendant over this roadway made by the ro uh, defendant as an invitation to those having business with the railroad company to use it. The question of whether it was a public highway or not is of no moment. If it appears that the railroad company opened that road, which may have been entirely upon their own property, and invited those having business with the railroad company to use it, why, they are held to just as high a degree of care as if it were a public highway so far as those using it, doing business with the railroad company, are concerned. You see, it is common sense. The plaintiff said he turned toward the railroad and he saw a train that had pulled in, and he saw a train that was broken apart in order to make a passageway across as I understand the testimony, and he saw the engine and car that afterwards came in collision with his truck, some distance up the track to his left. But it was still standing still, he said, and he did not hear any bell. Now, on that point, you have in mind the testimony is very contradictory. A number of witnesses swore pro and con on that question. You will have to consider in the light of all the circumstances and the reasonable probabilities and make up your minds where in all human probability the truth lies. Then let us consider the obstruction there. The plaintiff says that he saw that engine and car at a standstill about as he drove beyond an obstruction he says was six feet high that shut off the view of that car and engine and he was looking elsewhere to see that nothing was coming from the other direction as any careful man would be doing over a number of tracks near a depot where trains stop as they naturally do. He says he was doing so and as he drove beyond the pile of tears on his left the front wheels got on the track and the railroad collided with him. Now, in the light of all the testimony, giving attention to the testimony of every single witness, which theory of this accident is, in all human probability, as nearly as we can figure it out, the correct one. Now, it is for you gentlemen. I am glad that I am relieved of the responsibility of passing upon that question. But these controversies must be settled. Here is the tribunal for their settlement. You are the twelve men upon whom your state calls to pass upon this controversy, and I want you to face the responsibility like men, and do the very best you can with it. If you do that, you will have done your full duty. Nobody can do more. Now, as to the case of the administratrix, of course it depends upon the very same facts. You must always keep in mind that instead of considering the negligence of the plaintiff in the case of the administratrix, you consider the negligence of the father of the boy, the plaintiff, in the other case. 
it were really practically amounts to the same thing because if he was negligent and his negligence contributed to this accident, there can be no recovery in his case because his negligence in the child's case was the negligence of the child and that defeats recovery.